Thank you everyone for watching from wherever you are. I'm so excited for you to join us today. My name is Emily Rosado and I'm here with my friend Monica Kang this way. <laughs> um, many of you know me as Professor Rosado and um, I teach at Montgomery College. I'm also a mental health advocate. I do volunteer work for Every Mind, which is an organization that promotes um, mental wellness and I'll link that information down below but today Monica and I are going to talk about mental health. Um, my friend Monica is the founder and CEO of Innovators Box and uh, we'll hear all about that later um, but for now Monica why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Thank you for having me and super excited to have this conversation. Hi my name is Monica. Um, I started Innovators Box because I realized, you know, you could get stuck in the job you love, which I'll speak a little bit more about. But basically, Innovators Box help uh, companies and leaders and individuals like yourself learn how you can be more creative wherever you are and know that how it is an important part of who we are. And so I do a lot of workshops, training, but also really helping others shift their mindset through uh, the culture and leadership and where we are. And so I do a lot of programming, but most importantly, how we rethink about how we live and live our days each day with creativity. And I feel like that's so needed right now <laughs> where we're all yeah. stuck in, you know, like quarantine mode and a lot of us are struggling with, mm -hmm. you know, just not being able to see our colleagues and, um, you know, to get that interaction. Mm -hmm. But to give our viewers some context um, for why we're talking about this now, in 2008, the National Alliance of Mental Illness designated that July is Minority Mental Health Month. And um, that's important because it's a time where we try to raise more awareness for some of the issues that um, that minorities face, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, that they face um, in navigating the systems of trying to get care. We know that the research shows that um, access to care is lower among people of color. Um, access to quality care, you know, is not as good. And there's also a you know, cultural stigma, right, um, associated with seeking help. And Monica, you know, you and I are both Korean. And, um, and I'm also part of the Latino community. I'm half Puerto Rican. So, um, so before we kind of like delve too much into that, I first wanted to ask you, um, so I know you as Monica, the, the bubbly, positive <laughs> CEO and founder of this amazing organization, but uh, why don't you share with us what you did before your days at Innovators Box? Thank you for sharing that. Um, so yeah, before that I was in public policy and government. Uh, I wanted to be a diplomat and so I pursued that career. My expertise was in nuclear weapon security and I love my job, so, uh, still respect and love the industry and the people very much, but uh, I quickly got stuck and depressed in the job I love. It was really more of the particular structure and the framework and really just realizing that my expectation of the job and the type of life was not aligning. And most importantly, just forgetting that I couldn't remember the last time I did something really for myself and not trying to perfect what that resume and that path is. Um, but unfortunately, it did lead me to getting really depressed, even suicidal at some point, um, and really needing to rethink that through. Um, and what helped me get out of it was actually the creativity and creative mindset. And while I do have painting in my background, that's not the type of creativity I'm just talking about. And creativity really has billions, trillions ways of expression, art is just one of the many ways. And I think that and discovering that and reminding myself what that meant actually was really a critical element to re-loving my job, thriving actually there again, uh, before I transitioned and started doing my company. Um, but yeah. So what, so I think, um, I know for me, like when you say nuclear weapon security, I have no idea what that means. So why don't you just kind of briefly tell us like what that means? Like, what did you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I mean, so nuclear weapon security is based, as you acknowledge is a big jargon. There's basically different niche industries. I was in nuclear forensics policy, which basically meant that for those who are in the nuclear forensics realm, which is, if you think about uh, like police forensics, if somebody detected that there's a nuclear radioactive material, what does that mean? Who goes and does what? How do country represents discuss and make decisions? And so what I loved about that space was just like the importance of communication, collaboration. Like you can see 10 different stakeholders talking and one person miscommunicating that gives a whole phone <laughs> miscommunication. One person not answering a phone call and then leading to another. 
because uh, radioactive materials are active and um, in a lot of regions around the world, no matter where it happens, uh, it's not a silo event because somebody might have smuggled it, somebody might have accidentally stepped on something and then the consequences are huge. And so that whole aspects of how that impacts safety, security and the individuals who live anywhere in the world and what that consequence is, was really interesting to learn about, again, that you really can't have one expert, you need everyone to work together and collaborate uh, and just knowing how much that trust in people communication pieces. And so I love the industry and respect. Uh, we need a lot more amazing people and thank God we do who we have so far. Um, so yeah, that's that industry in itself is that. Well, and I can see how your work there um, informs what you do now because you do a lot of work um, teaching people how to facilitate and how to communicate positively. And I think that's really important. So thank you for that <laughs> and for sharing your expertise with other people. Um, so I know that you've written a book and I want you to tell me a little bit about that book. I know that, um, you know, you and I have talked previously in other conversations about how, you know, you went through a period of um, depression and, and even at one point felt suicidal. So can you share a little bit about that experience with us? Mm. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, even though I loved my work, I felt stuck and, um, I think the clear visibility was just that, uh, I remember, I remember waking up and I remember thinking, I don't remember the last time I woke up feeling happy. And um, that was a really scary thought, especially because as Emily mentioned, I am, my natural state is bubbly, happy, you know, being optimistic and um, people usually gravitate that to me and expect of me. And I kind of am in that when I'm my genuine happy self. And for me to realize, I couldn't remember the last time I woke up feeling truly excited about my day, scared me and I realized I don't remember and I don't know why and um, and this is only kind of I guess the scary thing is that I didn't realize Emily I mean at that time when I was going through those emotions that that's actually depression or suicidal like I think that was one of the reasons why how I went about it was very different um, but I feel grateful uh, that uh, one decision at least I made was that okay maybe it's going to be less embarrassing to cry in the bus where everyone sees and like cry to work because uh, they can't see me with my big sunglasses. <laughs> and so I'm going to figure out how to like walk to work, which actually ended up being an interesting decision because that simple decision meant I had to change 10 other things, which is I have to wake up earlier to make sure I'm wearing comfortable shoes. I had to check the weather condition. I had to wear a comfortable outfit. I might need a change in the office. I might need to think about what time I leave, what time I arrive. So because I'm exercising in the morning, actually, then I'm more energized and pumped up by the time I get to the office. And so I shared some of those stories in my book, Rethink Creativity, which is right here, because one of the things that I wanted to emphasize, kind of debunking what that creativity and mindset is, to, and to really show that the mindset piece was really the key thing that helped me break out of understanding depression and suicidal, because I was the creator of what my negative storyline was and for me to get out of it was me learning how to tell my positive story and seeing what the scenario is to mean something different and so a quick example is like if you think about traffic or weather like people often complain oh like I'm going to be late again because of the traffic I'm going to be late because of the weather but we're letting those events influence us to experience negativity and then project what we're going to experience but if we know how to um, and understand how our mindset works, what I realized and know how to be more creative and know how to kindle that curiosity and that mindset piece, it means that, oh, well, because of traffic, you know, guess what? Uh, I might run a few minutes late, so I'll tell this person, but now I'm gonna use this time to listen to this podcast that I wanted to, I'm gonna call my friend, and that's so cool. Uh, weather is raining, oh, that means maybe we wanna make sure we get that soup dumpling that I really wanted to try. I wanted to make sure I try on a rainy day, right? It's a very, I'm projecting that and that becomes very different. And I think that was one of the things that I realized that, you know, yes, there's many other ways, but at least one way that I could shift the way I thought about my crying was really in kind of letting world happen to me was how would I shift the way I experience all of this in, be the owner, take the ownership of what experience in life I was living. And that mindset was part of the creative mindset 
that only in hindsight that I realized because people say, you somehow seemed happy, but you seem happier and you, we can't figure out. I'm like, I don't know either. Um, and so when you mentioned about the book, that's part of the story I wanted to allude to kind of help break down because I think creativity and innovation is something that we often have such a stigma to think about. It has to be artistic or it's like just a business concept. But I, I wanted to add that personal story and many other personal stories in the book to show that, yes, it's a business and, uh, but it's also tied very much to personal because how you show up to work um, influences from what happens when you wake up in the morning, from the moment that when you leave the office, you bring that energy back home. And especially now with quarantine time and COVID, there's no fine line. And I think we're seeing clearly why we should have actually thought more holistically and really took mental health as something more critical uh, and not something on the side. So that was a handful, but connecting the dots on that. Well, I mean, there's there's so many things that you said that really resonated with me. Um, you know, you were talking about like the energy that you bring to the workplace. Um, and I definitely, you know, try to be intentional as well. Like when I walk into the classroom, I want to make sure that I am um, showing my students, I'm really enthusiastic to see them and that like, I'm just happy, right? I'm happy to be there. Um, I'm happy to have the job that I have and that I can, you know, hopefully, you know, influence them in a positive way. Um, I also really like how, um, I think a lot of what you said speaks to mindfulness, right? And kind of like being in the moment and not letting, um, you know, I think it's so easy for us to get like really frustrated with those like little minor annoyances, like you said, being late for a few minutes. And like, I mean, that could just ruin our day, right? Like, you know, so many people are like, well, I woke, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, right? And like, my day's ruined now. But like, that's, that's not the case. Like, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so I, I really appreciated that, how you would take like these small moments of frustration and say, okay, well, what can I do? Um, or how can I make this like better, right? How can I turn this into something that's positive, even if it's just something simple, like you said, as trying out an, a new food, which I'm all about food. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I really appreciated that. Um, you know, I think it's important for uh, people watching to know that, you know, mental health challenges are, are treatable, right? And, you know, there are different ways um, you know, our brains are just these like amazing organs and we all have different brains and we all react differently to different things. And um, I think it's important for people to know that um, there are different kinds of treatments and different things you can do, right? So like for my own struggle with anxiety, you know, medication and, and therapy worked really well. That helped me. And, you know, specifically what helped me the most was equine therapy, which is working with horses which was just so amazing um, to have that time. Like you learn so much from these animals who are so you know, gentle, but also like so wise. Um, and I know that you took a different approach. Um, you did more of like, you know, kind of like the mindfulness approach. So I guess for someone watching maybe who, um, you know, who, who's interested in that and, and who kind of like is attracted to, like to what you're talking about about like kind of like using the power of your mind to help yourself can you maybe offer some tips or talk a little bit more about um your success with that no thank you for asking that um i think just to highlight that emily i mean it's so important for everyone to be reminded that um if you know for sure that you're not at a happy state whatever that means um and you feel a bit more frustrated because you tried these different approaches that you heard that was working, but it's not working for you. So it feels more frustrating. Um, I want to first acknowledge and say that that's okay because it's like, just because somebody says that taco place is good, you might not have the same opinion. Like just treat it like that, right? Just because some people like rainy weather doesn't mean that you have to like the rainy weather. And so I think it's absolutely important to first have that self-awareness piece that you know, just because it worked for one person doesn't mean that it will be the same for you. And so if it doesn't, then it's just finding a different approach. And I think that uh, recognizing and acknowledgement is empowering because it's less of, oh, is it me who is the fault for not getting it? It's more of, it's just not a right fit. I mean, there's a reason why we have tons of different clothes, tons of different types of houses, tons of different types of books, 
food, uh, going back to food, and because we all want and need different things. And so I think that one thing I'm going to emphasize, and then once you recognize that, then it connects to, okay, then what indeed is something that I am inspired by. And so I encourage, like, I tend to, like, break th breaking things down to make it more manageable. And so that might mean, like, thinking about what actually makes me happy. Do you have a list of, like, 10 things that just makes you plain happy? Um, is it that maybe you call your best friends or, like, your family or you just spend time out with the nature of with the horses or, you know, whatever that means? Or is it that mean that you spend an hour just not doing anything? Maybe sometimes it's just binge watching a show. That's okay too. But find like, if you haven't done the activity, just take a moment right now, pause and just write down at least 10 things that you know for sure that makes you happy. Um, and then do a second thing, maybe 10 things that you remind you to be grateful of. Um, and then do something like that in a similar way. So like 10 things that you know that inspires you no matter how, um, what day it is. Uh, but also about the negativity, like, you know, at least five or 10 things that you know that immediately makes you shut down or feel discouraged. Because I would say, I think I found it helpful understanding what were the triggers or moments that made me unhappy or sad to know that I can catch myself uh, and be more fully present. Uh, and it's funny because actually when I share this with some of my friends who are therapists, they did say, you know, it's really important to go a step deeper. And I want to emphasize on that. Uh, as somebody who's not a clinician, but just as somebody who practices is that I'm not saying that you need to like color it and say, oh, because this is a trigger, this is always going to be like that. It's important for you to just note it as awareness, right? You're just noting it. It's like, oh, I see the color is blue today. Um, I don't like that, but that doesn't mean that it always has to be the answer. I don't like it. Maybe you're going to like it one day um, because you just acknowledge it and you're aware of it. And so uh, again, just want you to make that note more for awareness and with that thought activity, what I hope you notice is now you see things with more clarity and practicing and honing your observation eye, which is going back to Emily's word choice, mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness, I think, in, in my sense, especially with creativity and the creative mind, is that to be mindful, you have to learn how to observe sharper with everything and have the courage to say, wow, this dot right here in this event has no correlation, but in your head, you see why it could be connected or how it influenced. And if it's not, then the eye of observation is making you curious to wonder why or what you notice certain things. And so my favorite phrase, hence I put myself in that curiosity mindset is saying things like, I noticed, I wonder, um, I try to interpret things more of like assuming good intention, but openness to say, hmm, what, why is that going on? Like, I wonder what that could mean. And really learning to train your eye from a third party perspective, which is hard because our gut instinct is to react to situations, which is why when we feel sad, it's a reaction. Um, but learning how to buffer in that pause is permitting us to be fully mindful and aware, but also hence observe things from a third party to notice whether it's your emotions, your thought processes, but also hence training it. Um, but again, that's why the simplified way I start recommending is just think about what are even things that make you happy because we say we know it, but until you write it down and actually list it, you might realize that we're not honoring enough space. So, and the more specific you are, the better. Uh, instead of saying cooking, maybe the element that you like the most is the act of cooking and sharing food with people you eat. So it's not the act of cooking, it's maybe the sharing piece that actually brings you joy. Or maybe the cooking piece is bringing joy because you're learning a new recipe. Or maybe you like the cooking because you are actually honing a skill of cooking. So it's the honing aspect. So the more specific you know, um, for instance, even when you are having those rainy days, you will know how to pick yourself back up because you built now that resilience and awareness. And so that's kind of the cycle that I think of going back to that self-awareness, that happy list of, um, aspect. And so um, I, and these are kind of different thought bubbles that I kind of share, but again, different building blocks. Um, but what I hope you're all hearing again is a reminder that it's not just a one straight line. For some of you, it feels like the happy list is the easy thing. For others, it's going to be probably the hardest thing because they're like, I don't know. I think everything makes me kind of happy. Um, try to differentiate what makes you a little bit even happier than the other kind of stuff because that's where the details make a difference. Um, and what are the things that you know make you upset versus really upset? Um, and so, uh, yeah, these are different kind of thought bubbles that I wanted to share. But again, I wanted to share it in a way that 
for those who are listening, you're probably gonna have segments that resonate with you more versus others that you already feel like you're doing. And the story, again, the importance is you gotta do it in a way that works for you. Build on your self-awareness and really build on that and, and make it fun. Like, please make it fun. That's the key piece of it. Because if you're not, then it's gonna feel like work. And who likes to do like work that we're told to do? So have fun with it. Yeah, none of us like extra work. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think that's so important. I mean, writing down the list of things that make you happy, like you said, it seems like it might be really easy, but I think for a lot of people who aren't used to kind of like reflecting internally, that might be a difficult task. But, um, but putting words to those feelings and like what like brings you joy, I think is really important to that self-awareness piece that you were talking about. Um, and I had never thought about like writing down things that I know I don't like, right? Because most people can think of that pretty easily, but I think also like putting pen to paper and like articulating that um, now that you mention it, I think might help us to, to set some of those boundaries that we need to set. Um, and I think that's so hard. <laughs> and like you're um, referencing, you know, it takes practice, right? It, it's like a, it's like a mental muscle, right? And the more that we do it, the more we practice that self care and gratitude, and setting those boundaries that you know, the easier it becomes. So thank you so much for that. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about like cultural stigma, right? I know that for me, um, being part of, you know, an Asian American and Latino household, um, there wasn't always a lot of support, right, for, for mental health. Um, and I, I have students who will share similar stories with me, you know, their parent, you know, they might be like first generation Americans and their parents, you know, may be of different cultures and they'll share with me that, you know, their parents like don't really like believe in depression or, um, you know, their parents advice is to like just be strong, you know, be strong. Um, you know, suck it up, you're okay, um, everybody has bad days. Or one of my students said, you know, his mom would tell him, like, you need to pray more, you know, which, you know, is good, but is that really gonna cure depression, you know? Um, so I guess, what advice would you have for, um, for people of color, right, who are having challenges, you know, just talking to their families about this, or, you know, just challenges, like not even knowing where to go or how to start? Thank you for sharing that. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's the very reason why I think sometimes when I do speak on this topic, I say, I think uh, it's great that we have programs, various programs, whether it's suicide or depression, but I just know for, I just know even in my case, like I never thought for one second that, oh, I'm having these thoughts, I should call the suicide hotline or I should seek help because I was never told about those things or never knew that was an option or that I was going through that. Like I didn't know that only until I got out of it. Cause sometimes you're in the thick of it, all these emotions, you just know it's bad, but you don't know how to get out of it other than just talking to people. And when they tell you those things, you feel even more at loss because you feel, at least for me, I felt bad for not having figured out and that made it feel worse um, and just run through those. And um, science shows how as human beings, we are very good with uh, negative emotions. I mean, there is enough science that proves that you have to receive at least nine compliments to equal one negative feedback. Um, and uh, you can then envision almost like when we're at that depression or suicidal mind. Um, again, everyone and how we handle and build on that is very different. You know, I'm not clinician, so absolutely want to just make that part clear. Um, and so uh, one piece though, I found really thinking about is knowing that process is different. Uh, yes, talking to family and friends was helpful, but uh, I didn't get the full solution until I had to really put in the hard work myself. Um, and I didn't know what to read or where to go because, uh, because I was scared as well. I just knew those thoughts were happening. And that's where I shared those, you know, uh, you know, a quick list when you are at a good state or when you're even not to start. Um, I think, hence separate from that as, you know, growing up Asian American, having grown up both in the States and Korea, uh, mental health still has a strong stigma in both of the countries that I grew up with. And um, 
I think about this now even more so as uh, somebody who's an educator also and now working with students and professionals from all different range. And I mean, it, there's really no plain answer, I think, because like, would I have, would I have wished that I known that there were services? Frankly, I'm not really sure because I don't know if that in itself would have helped me. Um, I don't know if I would have felt comfortable if I knew a therapist or that that was possible. Um, so the truth is like, I really don't know, um, which I hope kind of makes it almost like a relief for those who felt like there is an answer, because I think if you feel like you don't know, I think that's okay. Cause I think I still don't know what the right answer is. And I just am taking it day by day and, you know, addressing one by one. Um, but what I chose in the time being was that I, um, am a big fan of reading and uh, watching movies. And so going back to my happy list, one of the things that really helped me process through was just reading more and um, watching like movies more. And so because I was so feeling sad and upset to spend time with people over time, and I wasn't getting the emotional kind of validation that I needed, I just started reading more books. I'm like, okay, what are books in good writing that really inspire me? That is like kindling my thinking. And that's where one of the other kind of statements I say often with creativity is just a reminder that you become what you consume. And so it's really, really important that um, knowing that if you are seeing those negative thought bubbles, again, nine compliments equal one negativity, you can only imagine how much of positivity you need to outweigh because that's a lot of work. Don't try to do that by yourself, whether it's like you loving to read, uh, you know, watching movies, even TV shows. Like I still binge watching a lot of cheesy TV shows because it makes me laugh. Like they're so powerful about a laughter that is just genuine, that heals you. Um, and now that I've been doing more research and just learning about how that human mind works now, like now I get it, like why it takes so much effort to heal. And so I guess the way I'm expressing is that it's okay that you don't know the way I, because I still don't, uh, there's no really perfect number two, start with at least where you do get positive inspiration, whether it's books, movies, or, you know, if it's people, that's great. But if you're hearing those things and you know that you don't feel like it's enough, just again, make that as an observation, but don't let that be a defining factor. Um, and neither criticize because they're probably just saying it out of what they want to support out of goodwill. They don't know how as well. So, you know, instead of, again, with the lens of criticizing them or blaming them, they're just saying and sharing what they can. Um, you decide what your narrative of your life wants to be. And you choose each day one step at a time. Do I want to wake up feeling sad tomorrow? Or do I want to feel feeling a little less sad at least? Um, that was the thought process at least helped me. And I hope that could inspire you at least wherever you are right now. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love that you mentioned books, not just because I'm an English professor, <laughs> but I really um, believe in like the transformative power of sharing stories and um, reading other people's stories. Um, I think that's how we build empathy and um and learn better how to relate to each other so um so i i like that you find inspiration in that and i also want to thank you for your honesty because i know that like from the outside looking in you know i could easily say like wow like monica has her own company she's young she's amazing but like you know but there have been struggles right and i think for me too like people will tell me like well you make it look so easy and i'm like what are you talking about like every day is a struggle right i mean every day is you know i have to be really intentional with like my mindset and you know with what i want to accomplish and you know just the kind of energy that i want to put out into the world so um so yeah so i really appreciate that i feel like we need more of that honesty and more sharing stories and um you are just an inspiration to us all thank you so much for sharing, for sharing and for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to me um if anyone watching um wants to share their story or has questions for us um are you okay with that monica if, if people type yes, in questions of course um, yeah, to kind I of would... keep back on your last comment, I think book wise also, it doesn't have to be just about mental health because like that was absolutely not the book I was reading. I just chose from fiction to nonfiction to things that just inspired me. So like from creativity books, that's actually how I 
coincidentally read a lot of creativity books because what I realized reading like creative mindset or like just mindset and psychology books, like I was just very curious about why am I feeling sad? Like what is causing me sad? What is causing me to be happy? How does the mind work? Maybe I can learn about it. And like that thought process, I think as a nerd just intrigued me. And so it got me to start seeing my sadness more in a curious lens instead of a reactive lens, which I didn't realize until I got out of it. And so actually a lot of these books were books that I went through during that time that really inspired me. There are some that are essays of somebody who like talks about how they had a difficult time in their lives. And some are just like, this is how you can be a positive person, or this is how you should like, can be a good leader. So this is like the magical land of something. So like all different types, but it was just like out of pure personal joy. Um, it wasn't because somebody asked me to do it. It was because I wanted to. And I think that again, insight is really key. It's like you choosing and finding what brings you joy, hopefully healthy choices, uh, just to make it clear. And then uh, going back to one step at a time. And so just wanted to add to that. And the, hence the intentionality, it's a decision we make every day. Um, and that's why even today, um, and I shared this actually social media posts among my friends of like, I've been, I've had many days where I wake up with a lot of anxiety because it's open and I am facilitating 20, 30 hours a week for 200 plus people in the past few weeks. So I am a little burned out, um, because I'm human too. And so I tell one thing I've been telling is every time I wake up being anxious, instead of ignoring that, I've been focusing on how do I hundred X my heart and empathy so that way I, I see the stress and anxiety but it's looking smaller because my heart is bigger I can I know I can manage it I just like need to tell myself and sometimes I can do it within it one statement sometimes it takes 20 30 statements so I uh, just want to add that it you know just honesty of that it's really the result of intentionality and you choosing the days and the hours you want to create again because we become what we consume so you think about what you're consuming in your mind and what you're telling yourself so that you get to experience. Um, and if we know what we can eat is influencing how we're healthy in our physical body, think about our healthy mind of what we are giving our mind to. So yeah, just wanted to add those few things. I love that. I think that's such a, um, that's so wise to, um, to view your consumption in that way, right? Like you become what you consume. I love that so much. And um, there's something else that you said, oh, so, um, like, so positive affirmations, right? So like you were saying, it takes like nine positive. Um, yes, nine thing, right? compliments. To That's it. so I'm interesting to me because, yeah, because I, you know, I read a lot about trauma for, you know, for my research and, um, you know, our brains are hardwired to remember those negative experiences as a protective factor, right? Our, our brain's trying to tell us like not to like experience that again, right? Which in a way is like, thank you brain for like looking out for me. But but that's why the, that's why those negative experiences like are so um, like vivid in our minds. So to counteract that, like you said, right? We really need to like fill our, um, you know, our, our days and, and what we consume with like positive things that are gonna like lift us up and like, nourish our minds and our bodies. So I appreciate that so much. Um, so Malika, can I list your, um, your information about Innovators Box in the description box and Absolutely. About your book? Okay. Yes. Yes. Awesome. I hope this was helpful for everyone. Thank you so much for your time again. And um, I will talk to you soon. Yes. Have a great rest of your week. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thanks, Monica.